These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos .htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. So we'll start with the concept of kinetic energy. Oftentimes people use a capital K to stand for the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy we can think of as a measure of the motion of an object. This is energy of motion. Kinetic means motion. You might think of this as saying, telling us how hard the object would be to bring to, to, to a halt. How hard would it be to bring the object to rest? That's what the kinetic energy is going to tell us. Well, let's say you increase the mass of the object. So you have a moving object. Um, but what type of moving object would be harder to bring to a halt, a massive one or a light one? So should this increase or decrease the kinetic energy to have a bigger mass? Increase. Increase it. So if we're making a formula, should the mass go in the numerator or the denominator here to have a direct relationship with the kinetic energy? Oh, no. Yeah. If we put it in the denominator, then there would be an inverse relationship between mass and kinetic energy. So the mass goes here. All right, how about if you increase the speed of the object? Would that make it harder or easier to bring it to a halt? Harder. Yeah, we know the faster something is moving, the harder it is to bring it to a halt. So in an increase in V, should that increase or decrease K? Yeah. So should V go in the numerator or the denominator? In fact, in this equation, there is no denominator. All right, so this, we're building up the formula for kinetic energy. These are things that um, should be kind of common sense, that M and B should be directly related to K. And then some things that are not so obvious, but turn out to be true, is that the full formula is 1 half MV squared. I just want to go through this pattern. Every time the instructor gives you a formula, you should always go through this little exercise of asking, what's the relationship between the variables? If I change one variable, does that increase or decrease the other variable? That just gives you a little intuition for what the equation means. But we won't talk about uh, too much why there's a 1 half and a square here, even though your textbook explains that. All right, so that's our kinetic energy. And this will give us a measure of how hard the object is to bring to rest. Now we need to know uh, what our, well, first of all, we need to know whether this is going to be a vector or a scalar. And this is something that people often don't learn correctly. I don't know if you picked up from class whether energy is a vector or a scalar. The answer is that this is a scalar. That pretty much has to be memorized. Whether something is a vector or a scalar is just part of its definition. Oh, that reminds me of something I wanted to do today. I guess we'll come back to that in a second. Um, what's the point of saying this is a scalar? It means we don't have to break it into components. Only vectors have to be broken into components. So it's very important for every concept to know whether it's a vector or a scalar, because otherwise you don't know whether to break it into components or not. So I would never say kx equals 1 half mvx squared, like we might do with some other concepts. Let's actually back up for a second then. What is the symbol for force? And what's the unit for force? Good. And is that a vector or a scalar? That's a vector. That's why we do have to break this into components. What are the component units of a Newton? How could we break a Newton down into smaller units? How can we? Per second squared. Per second squared. That's good. That's good that you knew how to do that because you're using our formula for force from Newton's second law. Force equals m times a. Well, the units for mass are kilograms, and the units for acceleration are meters per second squared. So when we use this equation, we've seen that we always write net force x equals mAx, or net force y equals mAy, because this is a vector. But again, we won't be talking about kx here, because that's not a vector. The unit for kinetic energy is the joule. One thing I think is really important in this class is to learn the units for each new concept that comes up. And now over the next few weeks, you're going to be learning a couple new concepts every week. So it's, it's easy to get them confused. It's important to memorize these units. You don't want to have to look those up in your cheat sheet. This helps us to get some intuition for what we're working on. Now, what are the component units of a joule? Well, it turns out that the component units of a joule 
are newton meters. I'm just going to tell you that right now. The component units of a joule are newton meters. So suppose I tell you that a object has a kinetic energy of six joules. How would we interpret this? What does this tell us about the object? Well, the first thing I would do is I would write that as six newton meters. Now, in this class, you're going to see lots of compound units. And people oftentimes have a really hard time interpreting what does a compound unit mean. Well, there's a trick for dealing with a compound unit. We can always stick in the number one without changing things, right? Well, the newtons already has a number in front of it, so I'm going to stick this number one in front of the meters. Obviously, that's legal. That doesn't change anything. But that makes it much easier to interpret this. What this tells us is that if we push on the object with six newtons of force, it'll take one meter before it comes to a halt. Remember, the whole point of the kinetic energy is to tell us how hard it would be to bring the object to a halt. Well, if the object is moving with six joules of kinetic energy, that would mean that um, if you're pushing with six newtons of force, the object will move for one more meter before it comes to a halt. This is a real important trick for interpreting compound units. Just stick a one in front of one of the other units to help you interpret it. Of course, it's arbitrary who you put the one in front of and who you put the six in front of. So we could also say that if we're pushing with one newton of force to bring this to a halt, we'll have to push for six meters before it comes to a halt, whichever is convenient for the problem that you're working on. For that matter, two times three is also six. So this also means that if you push for two, with two newtons of force, it would take three meters before it came to a halt. But usually when you're trying to interpret something, it's best to stick with the original number. So this is how we can stick with the original number in our interpretation. The important thing here is, again, this is a good trick for interpreting compound units that you'll see a lot in the course. Stick a one in front of one of the units. All right, so that's what our kinetic energy tells us. Um, one thing that we should emphasize here is, well, what, what do you think M stands for here? Mass. Yeah, it stands for mass. And how about V? What does that stand for? Velocity. Yeah, velocity. Um, although, maybe I should put a dot here to show this really, we're just taking the magnitude of the velocity or the speed. Uh, so you guys know that a symbol that I, I made up that I like to use is a dot for magnitudes. So we would just put in the magnitude. It doesn't make much difference here because we're squaring it anyway. Um, so if, even if we put in a sign, it would just disappear anyway. But this, it's important to see this only depends on the speed. So this only depends on how fast you're moving, not what direction you're moving. Unlike the force, which also depends on direction. Let's actually work with that for a second. Um, but what are the units for mass? Units for mass are kilograms, and this would be? Meters per The units for velocity are meters per second, and if we squared that, that would give us this. So this would be another way to write the units for um, kinetic energy. What did I want to show here? Oh, and we could rewrite that as kilograms times meters per second squared times meters, right? I could just split up the meters squared into two separate meters. But this is what we already decided was a newton. So anyway, now we just proved that joules must be newtons per meters. That's something that you might have to do sometimes on homework or on exams, manipulate units. So before I just told you that a joule was a newton meter, but now we kind of proved that a joule is a newton meter by working with these units. All right, and now we can understand what kinetic energy means more. Remember I told you it would tell you how hard it would be to bring the object to a halt. Well, now we can be more specific. It tells us, um, if for a certain amount of force, how, um, what distance you would have to push for before it came to a halt. Or for a certain distance, what force you would have to push with to bring it to a halt. kinetic energy has to always be positive, because mass is positive and v squared is positive. Scalars can conceivably be negative, but the kinetic energy can't be negative. 